it's been amazing to see how many people across the country have been helped by that song you know uh, you don't you, you put together your art and and you you hope it's helpful but you don't know how the lord's going to use it and um but that one really sticks out to me as one that's really held held its its own and that one actually was written in 700 a.d in greek originally the original uh, for that it was written by a guy named saint stephen of marsabas in 700 and uh so for 1300 years you know the the church has been singing it in some form or another and so it was cool to kind of take that to try to bring it back to the church and give us the opportunity to sing the same thing that a, the great cloud of witnesses is singing. Encourage us to press on. Welcome to our time together, Reframing Ministry, with a couple who understands what it's like to go through years of unanswered medical questions, chronic pain, ongoing challenges, that test perseverance and endurance. So Kenny and Claire, thank you for being with me today. Yeah, thank oh, you so much for having us. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having us. Take us back to 2010 when you were in search of a diagnosis or struggling with pain that had no answer. Oh yeah, so uh, we, we had a little bit of a conversation at the beginning. I, I was a facilities manager at a church, um, did a lot of physical work, I'd been a construction worker before then. And um, one day after doing some heavy carpet work, I just found I couldn't make it up the steps to my house. I've been having a lot of knee pain. I've been taking a lot of ibuprofen and whatnot. And I found myself being more and more tired. Um, some of that was my schedule, but I could tell that it was a little bit more than that. Um, eventually, I moved to a, a pastoral position and the, the pain moved to different places. And I um, was able to get to a doctor and he said, I, he thought I had rheumatoid arthritis. And that's usually, I think, from what I hear from the community, that, that tends to be the first diagnosis. Um, the rheumatologist found no swelling, plenty of cartilage. And he goes, uh, you got something else. Eventually it was fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. And you just, you know, I, I feel like everybody I know who's been diagnosed with a disorder or an autoimmune issue, it's almost like you go through the line of diagnoses and, you know, you get diagnosed, so you start looking up how to deal with it, how to treat it. You find that the treatments are actually making things worse, or you don't match the, the, the profile of the symptoms, and uh, you start off in another chase. I think it took us maybe 10 years to get to a real diagnosis, like a final diagnosis of, of what I had, something like that. Well, She's better with dates than We I. actually didn't get, okay, so just... We actually didn't get the final diagnosis of EDS until 2019 when we moved to Nashville because uh, right before we moved to Nashville, where we were in Raleigh, North Carolina, he was referred to a center for dysautonomia and they were going to do some tests and research. Yeah. But then when we moved to Nashville, it turns out Vanderbilt has a whole center for dysautonomia yeah. And they were able to narrow down and tell Kenny, okay, this is what you have and figure out his symptoms and then test him for what kind of EDS he has as well. So that was a huge grace and unexpected blessing and move into the Nashville area. And I will say this, like, um, when you're dealing with the autoimmune stuff, you know, most of the time there's not a cure. Uh, you, you, you have to deal with the symptoms in one way or another. Uh, but there is a treasure in at least arriving at a final diagnosis and going, okay, at least I can pin a name on what I'm dealing with. Especially, mm -hmm. you know, as I've talked to people who have autoimmune issues, you know, a lot of times doctors themselves won't believe patients and their symptoms. And uh, year, after years of being told you're making it up or it's in your head, to finally arrive at something that they can pin it to and say, hey, this, this at least gives you an idea of what's going on with your body is very helpful. Well, I think we all want to have some kind of answer mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because we're chasing these symptoms. And right. while this isn't a medical podcast, right. oftentimes medical issues direct us to what's in our soul. And yeah. so way yeah. before you even were diagnosed with that, you were dealing with something else, which on New Year's Eve, they, diag they diagnosed. Talk to me about that New Year's Eve 2015. Yeah. So, you know, in the years of searching and trying to figure out all these symptoms, um, I developed a tremor in my right side. Um, they decided that it's genetic now, 
But at the time, they were concerned that I might have multiple sclerosis or I might have Parkinson's. And so they did a, a brain scan to look for lesions on the brain. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they found the tumor instead. And um, the tumor wasn't causing any of my symptoms. Uh, but it was at the point where it was starting to slow down the flow of spinal fluid to my body. And so if they had not caught it, I would have gone into um, hydrocephalus. hydrocephalus, yeah, which would have caused some major issues and would have had to had emergency surgery, which isn't always as smooth as uh, planned surgery. So the Lord was really, really gracious in that. Um, I was, we we're just talking to somebody else the other day. One, one of the beautiful things in that, you know, the original diagnosis was that it was malignant and inoperable. Mm-hmm. And we were able to, by God's grace, get with the leading surgeon on the tumor. And uh, he was able to remove it. And he said when he was holding it in his hand that he looked at it and knew it was malignant. They went and tested it and it came back benign. Mm-hmm. And so the Lord just did a work there, you know, uh, was really gracious. Um, but even after the surgery, my symptoms got worse and worse because I had EDS and it was stirring everything up and it it led to a number of years where I couldn't work. It was hard. So EDS is Elder's Danlos Syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder and it can affect 13 to 14 different parts of the body. And did that play a part in the brain tumor or was that completely separate? No, the doctor said they weren't related at all. Um, They were just completely separate. And thankfully, like the only risk for the tumor I had was that it can grow back in the same place, but I'm, I'm still clear from 2016, so eight years. So the Lord's been really kind there. But I will say, if he didn't have EDS or have any of those symptoms, they never would have found the tumor in the first place. And that's just a well, huge Yeah, choice. until I went into like yeah. some medical, you know, major medical issue and yeah. maybe caused a lot more damage than, than right. otherwise. Claire, I just want to ask you, as you... How long had y'all been married before all of this started to unfold? The big questions, we got married 06, 07, 08, (laughs) Uh, June 7th, 2008. Uh, So whatever that is, 2015 with the brain tumor. That would have been seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Yeah. We um, had two toddlers and an infant at the time. Our youngest was just about to turn three months on January 1st. yeah, yeah, and we had a total different trajectory for our lives at that point, I will say. Uh, we thought that we would be in the mountains of North Carolina, that he would be serving as a pastor, I'd be serving as his wife, caring for our kids, and um, still do, yeah. just in different ways, <laughs> and not in the mountains of North Carolina anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The first two years, so in 08, you marry, 2010, you start having symptoms, 2015. So there's three kids that come along, then a brain tumor, and that gets removed. And then you have chronic pain. Yeah. As a caregiver, Claire, what were some of your experiences in the church, Um, experiences with friends, experiences that you wish were different? Oh, man. So many thoughts come to mind all at one time. Yeah. If I were to go chronologically, I would say the first thing, like when he got the diagnosis, I did not want to be at church. I did not want to be around people. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I knew that that's what I needed. And so I forced myself to go. And I, and my brain is a little fuzzy from that time. But I do remember being loved and cared for. Mm. and listened to even maybe when I didn't want to speak, if you will. Um, And the church, oh, man, they were there for us in so many ways. Um, Even congregations that we weren't part of anymore. mm -hmm. Yeah, Which that is so unusual. That is so unusual. Um, Grace, just the (laughs) Lord's grace through his people. Um, there were two two families in particular who were watching our, our youngest, our oldest two, while I, Kenny went to the doctor for the diagnosis of the tumor. And, of course, we called them after we called our family and let them know the news. And uh, 
of course, we didn't expect it, but by the time we got home, they had ordered in a full meal and were just there and cared for us on throughout the night. They were there to talk with and be with. There was times, too, where I just couldn't be near people. I loved them, but they respected that, too, and just gave me my space, let me go cry. And then when I could come back, I wanted to be with them at the same time. So they were just there. Um, I really don't think they went home till around 3 a.m., personally. uh, Yeah. I was up late with them. They they really cared for us. And there was another church um, that was out near where we had the surgery done um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, because we were at Duke University. And uh, they sent people. Um, A good friend of mine who's a pastor came and prayed over me before my surgery. Um, Now, I I will say, you know, at the time we were in a hard church situation. And we've been in some really hard church situations since then. Um, And I think that for us, it's been a matter of holding on to the good and and letting go of of the bad. Because we did, you know... you deal with people who mean well, but they'll say things like, well, maybe you should just sleep more or don't eat meat <laughs> or only organic food. You know, have you tried this food. diet? And, and what yeah, about that and medication? And, 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 yes. you, and you have to remember, even though it comes off painful when it happens, but you have to remember they're saying that because they care and they want you to feel better, you know? Um, but, but yeah, you, the church, because it's a group of people, it's a mixed bag and you have to be able to hold on to the good and, 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 and just set aside the hurtful things because um, they're going to happen. I mean, we, we're going to hurt each other. I mean, think about your closest relationships. You know, we have our marriage. We have our kids. Uh, we're all really good at hurting each other unintentionally. It happens. Mm. Um, it, it's part of life. And so, um, yeah, learning, learning. I've had to learn. <laughs> I've had to learn to be gracious and, and to say, okay, um, what can I take away from this that's helpful and, and, and nourishing, so uh- to speak? I will say that the term caregiver has been kind of hard to like wrap my brain around because yes, I need to take care of him and help him. And there was definitely a season where that was more prevalent than it is at the moment. Um, But also the struggle to do that, but also um, see him as my husband, not just the one I'm taking care of and me as his wife. And I have a tendency to want to pile all the burdens on my shoulders and say, okay, I got it. It's fine. I'll take it. But I'm human. (laughs) I can't take it. And um, so one is being honest when I need help. Uh, Mm. And that can be hard to do. But even with Kenny, I feel like at first I felt like it would be really hurtful to him if I told him, all that I was feeling and Hey, how your feelings really hurting me or really affecting me in this way. And, but I realized in order for us to have a healthier relationship, I've got to be honest with him about those struggles and saying, Hey, I just can't hold this right now or I'm struggling. And I will say because of that, even in his sickest, as best he could, he supported me too. just knowing that it was affecting both of us just in different in different ways. Yeah. And I think there was important, like communication in marriage is already important. Uh, but it's really important when you're dealing with a a health situation like this. And like, Mm. the problem for me is I have uh, up until I was sick, I had a very, very healthy life. I did a lot of things. Um, and all of a sudden there were a lot of things I couldn't do. Um, shortly after my brain surgery, I fell off my lawnmower twice, just trying to mow the lawn. And, you know, at, 30 having to go, Oh, I got to pay somebody to mow my lawn. Cause I can't mow the lawn anymore. Um, a lot of these, these things, I I've always been an avid outdoors person. Um, there was a lot I couldn't do for a long time. There's a lot I still can't do. Um, I wasn't able to teach my oldest to throw football until he was like seven, you know, like they just, I wasn't healthy enough to do that. Like I wanted. And, um, being able to be open with Claire about, you know, I'm feeling useless right now. I feel like I'm a drag on the family. This is really hard. And, you know, for her to say, well, that's not the case, you know, you need to rest. Um, we, you know, we just need to know how for a healthy marriage to operate, we have to know how the other person's feeling. And, and part of that, you know, if you look at first Corinthians 13, where Paul talks about love, um, it says love believes all things. And what he's getting at there is that genuine love assumes the best about the other person. And, 
our sinful nature has a tendency to want to imagine the worst about the people that we love the most when we're in a difficult situation. And so, you know, when I'm sulking and feeling bad, I'm thinking, man, she's so mad at me. This has got to be awful. You know, she probably hates what I'm going to, you know, like just, it just, it get, gets in your head. And then you have to think back, well, I've been married to her for so long and that's not the person she is. Like, you know, you just have to hmm. preach to yourself a lot of times. Uh, but having that open communication makes it, makes it better. Better. Not perfect, but better. <laughs> I said better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, I have so many things going through my mind. Like you touch on communication and you touch on the helpless feelings of being a man and being 30 and having to have people do your lawn when you think I should be able to do all of this. And then you've got the emotions of grief of yeah. the loss of what you thought would be and not being able to teach your son to play football when um, when other dads are out there doing that. I mean, this goes in so many different directions. And one of the things I did look up was when Paul is talking in Romans 7 about mm -hmm. how I want my body, I want my life to honor the Lord, but sin encapsulates me and it keeps me from doing what is right and good. So much of this resembles that sin nature that we're stuck in. Um, not that we're taken captive by it unless right. we choose not to reach out to Jesus. Right. Where did you both go for encouragement? Because yeah. there had to be times where there was conflict, where there was, we cannot figure this out. We've got three small children. Where did you go, Claire, Kenny? Where did you go for encouragement to make it through those hugely hard seasons? I will say that there was a previous thing that had happened earlier where I learned that the best thing to do was never to shove feelings under the rug to, mm. to acknowledge those and to acknowledge the grief. And I'm grateful um, for the lessons learned through that because as we faced everything we did with Kenny, I knew I just had to face it no matter what hard stuff it was. And there was grief. There was times where I remember grieving, thinking, are we going to be able to hike again? We love to hike. We love to walk. Are we going to be able to do all these fun things? This was in his worst moments. Um, few places that I felt like I found the most encouragement. One, of course, God's word. Um, I, there were some times in the busyness of the day that it would be I remember that I would just put on an audio Bible and just have it playing to listen, to try to just hold on to truth and listen to what God's word says, because left to my own thoughts, I didn't like where those were going and I needed just yeah. to be renewed in God's word. So an audio Bible or music or hymns that pointed directly to scripture and what God's word says. There were many times on a Sunday morning where I would go to church and I would be struggling and all these sufferings and all these dealings and ponderings going on in my heart. And I would either hear the word preached or God's word being read throughout the service or a song like he will hold me fast is one that uh, really stuck out. It's by Matt Merker. So, so encouraging. Um, but those things the Lord would use just to spur my heart on to say, this is true. Trust me keep going. Trust me. And, um, so another quote I found really helpful and I'm going to butcher it. I can't, I wish I probably should know this first line by line. I think it was John Piper that said something along the lines of there are times to grieve and grieve deeply. And I would hear that and I would be washing my face literally at the sink, getting ready for the day and just crying. Kenny would be in the next room just grieving what was going on, grieving different losses that we didn't have, but I thought we'd have. But then he does say, but then there's a time to wash your face, trust God, and embrace the life that he's given you. And um, those words definitely gave my heart a lot of encouragement just to keep keep moving forward. For me, there are a few things. Um, <clears throat> one, just, just to point out, like you talked about the connection of, of dealing with these things and our sin nature and whatnot. And Throughout scripture, um, we see that sin not only twists the spiritual world, but it twists the physical world too. And so those For are sure. connected. Um, in, in Isaiah 53, um, 
some of the words that are used in Hebrew kind of show that the Messiah is here to redeem, redeem those and renew those things as well. And so, um, as a pastor, as, as I, as I, um, was leading people through funerals and dealing with hospital visits and things like that. Um, you know, deep inside your soul, you, you feel this, this should not be, this should not happen. This is not the way things were created to be. And it, it led me to realize that we face these things to cause us to long for the kingdom that is coming when they will be done away with, to long for Christ to return and to, to, to captain this universe in his way. Um, but also, um, I was reminded by, I think it might have been a Puritan writer, but that he organizes all things to conform us to the image of Christ. And so even the sickness and the illness, all of these things are by his providence designed to conform us to Christ's image. And so it may not be that um, I'm going to get all the things that I want, <laughs> you know, um, but if I'm submissive to him and I'm humbled before him, he will conform me to the image of his son. And that's what I need more than anything else. Um, and I like to tell people, maybe, maybe I'm dealing with so many things cause I'm just so hard headed. <laughs> but, um, but those are the things that, that I was reminded of that were helpful. We, we often, sorry, Claire's got a little cough going. Um, okay. we're reminded of, uh, uh, just the, the, the church together in the healthy things, like we talked a little bit earlier, like the church gathered in a healthy way is very formative. Um, I, I think the biggest thing for us and what led us to do what we do is uh, just the way that the hymns and, and various um, biblical uh, music uh, guided our hearts through the time. Um, Claire often talks about in our, in our concert, how, you know, in the season of struggle with my health, it's hard to, to, to have the energy to discern whether the lyrics you're hearing are biblical and good, or if they're just from the imagination, imagination of the songwriter. And, uh, those are the things that helped us. And so when it came time for us to start songwriting again, we're starting to, to produce music. We just decided we wanted to produce something that did the same thing that helped us uh, to try to help other people. And it's bizarre that, you know, when, when it came time to record our first album was right after COVID. And um, wow. I felt like the Lord ordered those songs to come alongside people and help them as they were dealing with uh, death and, and depression. The three things that you guys have mentioned, one is just for Claire to put on just God's word, just have that. I'm reminded of James 1, where... Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, Psalm 1, where he talks about meditating on the word day and night. It's a constant hum in the back of, in the background. Yeah. Just to keep, whether you're paying attention to it or not, you're hearing God's truth pour into you. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that you both admitted we're weak and we need Jesus to help us be strong. We cannot do this on our own. And then worship. So as songwriters, as I mentioned before, we even started recording, just your music is so calming and peace giving. Um, how has that been a part of the healing process for you? Or at least not just healing, because on this side of heaven, unless God intervenes, healing is not going to happen. Right. Um, yet you can live with so much more hope. How has worship been a part of that? I think that, I mean, just the way the Lord, the Lord works things in that when we come to worship him, we're worshiping him. And all of a sudden our eyes are off of ourself and onto the truth of who he is. And I think of Romans 12, one about renewing our minds, right. Yep. And just renewing our mind in the Lord, who he is his gospel, we need it, whether we're sick or whether we're not. Um, we all the time in all seasons of life, we need it. And sometimes those times of suffering or hardship can highlight it. And I feel like they can, and I say this gently, but they can be a blessing in that they highlight our need all the more for our Savior. And because of that, we can know him in a deeper way. And that's a true blessing and a true grace to come out of all of that. Um, 
in our in our music that we write, we do intentionally want it to point to the truth of God's word so that it can be like a rope for someone to hang on to. It's not our words, but hey, this is what God says, like cling to him, keep on, press on in the faith. Um, and so, yes, that's hugely influenced a lot of the way that we write. Uh, one of the things that we've done devotionally for a while is read. He's looking at me like, oh, it's my turn to talk. Sorry. No, no, you're good. <laughs> What is that? Read old hymns. Yes. Not that hymns are scripture. They're not. But a lot of them are deeply rooted in the truths of scripture. They can give such a beautiful and helpful perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, William Cooper's hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread. They're big with mercy and shall break and blessings on your head or -hmm. another line in that song is behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face just what beautiful truths of god's sovereignty and goodness in the midst of crazy um that we can remember and claim and so as we've read songs devotionally um it's very fun for me to put melodies to them and Mm -hmm. to arrange them or, or tinker with them if you will play with them in a way to update them to to make them perhaps more understandable to a modern listener, but yet at the same time preserving the beauty of the the older language. Um, so that's been a major comfort to us, I would say, in songwriting. And then, yes, simply writing songs claiming the truths of Scripture. Um, we, we wrote a song on Psalm 23, And that song was birthed out of, there was a season where I was anxious about other things. This was in the spring of 2022. And uh, actually, I was anxious because we had just started being artists full time. (laughs) And I was just like, Lord, that would be anxiety producing. How is this going to work out? And uh, I remember, again, getting to the end of Psalm 23 Mm. and singing, surely his goodness and mercy will follow me. And then uh, my kids started to sing it. I noticed them in the other room. And I thought, well, oh, that's catchy. Maybe I should put all the promises of Psalm 23 to this song for our family and then later for others. So I guess in to tying that all in, worship personally also sometimes bleeds over into or worship corporately, sometimes bleeds over into worship personally and worship through writing music and yeah. sharing music. Yeah. So for me, um, before my surgery and before the, the, the onset, the heavy onset of EDS, um, I was a pastor and I'd been an adjunct professor for a seminary and, and did a lot of academic work in biblical languages and stuff like that. And that's where I thought I would spend my time. And um, I found after my surgery, after the flare up that came after my surgery, that I just, I didn't have the energy. Like I I try to write sermons and they still, they'll wear me out. I mean, there's a lot of intense thinking that goes into it. Um, but there's something special about music. Um, shortly after we returned to Raleigh, um, this church that we were part of that kind of helped pastors deal with harder situations they'd been through. And they put me in their ministry and let me um, intern there for a little while. But they split it up. One was teaching Sunday school classes, but the other was being part of the worship team. Mm-hmm. And I found that physically and and emotionally I handled writing and singing better than I did the academic or you know side of things I love academic work but I do it a lot more slowly it affects my body differently than the singing and the and the music and and that's just maybe the way the Lord has designed it to keep me on the path I'm on (laughs) you know I don't know for certain yeah yeah total dependence I mean how have you dealt with the frustration of that? Because you yeah. obviously have the gift of, or gifts of research and study and a strong mind, but the body, when it doesn't cooperate, has yeah. to be so frustrating. How do you have those conversations with the Lord about that? Yeah, I mean, it can be hard. I do, 
so I've gone back and read some papers I researched before my brain surgery and I don't remember reading any of the stuff, you know, and, and I don't, I don't read and take in information as quickly as I used to. And okay. for, but still quicker than me. I just want to clarify. <laughs> but for, for, for a long time, you know, I really, in the back of my mind, I was like, was this a waste? I spent so many mm. decades studying, like, is this a waste? Like, what, what am I going to do? And, um, as we've traveled and played our music, I've had a number of pastors ask me, can you help train our team on, on mm -hmm. theology of worship? What, what is worship? How does it work? How does it, how, why do we do the things we do? And by God's grace, I've just had the opportunity to start lecturing on those things and helping churches. And that's always been my heart with academic work is how can I help equip people? I, it's not just to what can I know for myself, but, but how can, how can this be useful? And so, um, yeah, uh, the Lord has been able to use my biblical languages background to start helping churches and speaking at conferences on those topics. And I didn't anticipate that when my illness first came out, you know, it was, <clears throat> you just don't know what he's going to do with what he's prepared you for. And, uh, now I wouldn't have it any other way. I love what we do and I love getting to help churches in that way. Uh, but again, it's not something I could have planned. And you just kind of have to hold on, roll with it, and see what the Lord's going to do. Well, one of the biggest challenges that I find in having to reframe our lives is to adapt and adjust to what is versus yeah. what we thought. And we no, can yeah. cling to what was and think that was the answer. And yeah. then we don't know what God is doing or what's ahead. So there's yeah. that in-between tension. Help us mm -hmm. walk through that tension that occurs. My mind, my mind goes to the psalmist. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, a lot of the lament Psalms, they'll yeah. say, how long, Oh Lord, are you going to abandon your people forever? But they always yeah. come back around to, I know who you are. I know what yeah. you've done for your people. And I'm going to trust in that and not my circumstance. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part because all we can see is our circumstance. And we have to yes. recognize that he sees beyond that and he's ordered it for us to help us. We just have to trust him. And that's, that's the hard part. That, that really is. I mean, it sounds simple. And, and you know, that's, that's the funny thing about wisdom. It's, it's simple, but really, really hard, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. But yeah. I think of Ephesians 2.10 that talks about walking in the good work that the Lord has prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them and just walking one foot in front of the other. I don't know what those good works are. Sure. I'd love for them to be music, but there is <laughs> yeah. so much more than just music. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even the good work of feeding my kids dinner here in a few minutes, like <laughs> yeah, just he's prepared beforehand the good works for us. And that means that we're not, we're not left winging it. And if we make a mistake, we're going to screw up the Lord's plans for the whole universe and everything's going to fall apart. We're, we're, we're just not that powerful. Um, and yeah, we, I was going to say, who's that about? That is all about <laughs> yeah, us and not exactly. about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, no, if, if we, I was just reading a, a really great theological work uh, by an old author um, last night. And he said, you will not know yourself until you know God. And that's because we assume we're bigger than we really are. And uh, if we will humble ourselves and recognize that he is over all these things, that he's going to redeem them. And yeah. that means that even in our worst situations, good will come and, and, and everything will be made right. Um, it's, I made the rookie mistake one of my first years of preaching uh, to preach through the book of Revelation, uh, which is just hard. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, that was your first year. <laughs> oh my gracious. <laughs> Sunday evening sermon. <laughs> yeah, it was the Sunday evening sermon. Um, but uh, one of the things I got out of it is over and over and over, John basically says, look, the worst thing that can happen is you're going to die. Like that's the worst, but the Lord is redeeming the world and all will be made right. Those mm -hmm. martyrs who were before the throne, who were unjustly killed, they know the Lord is going to make that right. So if that's the case, the situation I'm in, I can look back and go, okay, he's promised 
and he cannot lie. So I need to rest in this will be good somehow. I don't know how. Um, I may never see the good, but he's good. And so I have to trust that, that he's, he's, going to, he's going to accomplish it. In the same way, I think of Romans eight twenty eight, where he says, you know, he works all things together for the good of those that love in him and are called according to his purpose. And that whole thing of all things work together. Sometimes I do get, have some intense conversations with the Lord on, on why did I just accidentally slam my hand at this door? How can good come out of this? This is very aggravating at this point in time. This is not, but to realize in everything, he is sovereignly working these things together for our good and that we can trust him. And it's hard for me to say, but I'm going to say it out loud nonetheless, because it's true. It's like on days when Kenny's just not feeling well and not on his A game or able to do what I'm expecting, um, that God is sovereignly over that too. And that he mm. is working that for all of our family's good <laughs> and that we can accept these hard things because he's the Lord, he's with us, you know? And that again, he, he promises that he's going to work him for good. So you had something you were going to say though. Yeah. Oh, I'm completely immersed in what you're saying right now. So I don't even <laughs> remember what that was. Um, I, I wonder how this has affected your children and how old they are now. So our oldest will be 13 in October. Okay. Our middle is 11 and our youngest will be nine in October. And, um, you know, we do try to have the policy in our home to talk about things, to be honest and to talk about things when they're hard, as is age appropriate, as best we can. Um, you're going to have to help me in my voice. No. <coughs> Sorry. She's having some allergy problems. My, um, <clears throat> like when the kids were little, they knew Papa had a boo-boo in his head, <laughs> but they didn't know the extent of what that meant. We need your help. Okay. Um, <coughs> you know, one thing I've seen is, um, our kids have, um, they've developed a lot of empathy. Um, yeah. I've seen them really care for other people. Um, one of the hard things, you know, so with EDS and probably one of the side effects from my brain surgery is that I fall a lot. Um, I do kids, too. So I okay. am all about that. Okay. <laughs> I so you, get it. You know it. what it's like. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice when you go to the hospital because you're a fall hazard, they cart you around in a wheelchair and have to take the bathroom and all that. My but, son is um, going to wrap me in bubble wrap for Christmas because he goes, mom, you're just a fall risk everywhere you go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not necessarily a little guy, but they, if they see like they, they've watched how I'm walking. And if I have a certain gait, they'll run up and grab my arm and steady me Interesting. And, and care for me. And that was something, you know, as a father, I never anticipated my children ever having to do. Um, but, um, I have seen them interact with say handicapped children or yes. um grown ups with with disabilities and, and stuff and them just be so empathetic and kind and welcome them in. And mm -hmm. I, I like to think that that's a side effect of them, you know, walking through this with me. Um you know, we're often at night, like we, we travel full time and our kids they come with us and they've seen a lot of I mean they've seen forty seven states um, but at the same time, as a parent, you're always wondering, is this good for them? Like, am I, <laughs> yeah. am I helping them? But I've, I've seen them be so amazing at getting to know people right off the bat and, and, and being so friendly and welcoming to people that I, I can't help but think that the Lord's using it for good, you know, in that sure. way. As we wrap things up and your music, I mean, it's just so so comforting to the soul. Is there a song that comes to mind that you wrote at a time when you thought, I've got nothing, Lord. I've just got nothing. And just put a song in my heart. There is a song on our new record called Have Mercy on Us. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I wrote it or wanted to really work on that one is because there are times I wanted to put a song to the times of just where our hearts cry is Lord help. 
Lord, mm-hmm. just help. This is hard. Would you listen to us? Would you help us? And um, I came upon a quote in a book that I'm reading, Be Thou My Vision. It's a devotional book. Mm-hmm. And the name of who wrote it scratched off the front. So honestly, I should look and see who that was. But um, there was a quote about Gregory the Great and it, uh, you know, a Lord uh, have mercy on us. Christ have mercy. Spirit have mercy. And so um, I took that as inspiration and wrote, Lord, have mercy on us. We beg you, hear us. Be gracious to us just as a way to, again, put words to those situations where we just need to say, Lord, help. <laughs> we um, Part of that inspiration was on our Out West tour last year, at the very end of the tour, uh, we were on our way home, heading from Louisiana to Nashville. And when we were coming through Alabama, a tire popped on our camper. Now, a tire is not a huge deal, but this was tire number three in the span of a couple of weeks. And they weren't, they didn't run any problems with the tires. We couldn't figure out what was going on. But that particular tire knocked the brake lines out on our camper, bent the axle, and when we called uh, the uh, roadside assistance to come help us, they said, we can't get to you. Did you know a tornado went across the road about a mile and a half in front of you about such and such time ago? At that, if our, if our tire hadn't have popped, we would have gone right into this tornado. <laughs> or we would have been there. We would have been there. Yeah. Kid you not. And so, yes, I was very thankful that the tire popped at that point. Even our kids said, Mama, God did that. It's like, yeah, he did. He sure did. But. Fast forward to Kenny was working on the tire because the roadside assistants couldn't come and help us. And he was of trying course. to cobble together his tools of what he what he could have. And so I'm standing on the side of the road beside him with a feeble attempt of holding my cell phone flashlight to let people know, hey, my <laughs> husband's here changing this tire. <laughs> and that song, at that moment, I thought, this I really do want to write, have mercy on us. Help us, Lord, a song to sing in those times where you are standing on the side of the road, scared half to death. You know he's with you. He just saved you from a tornado or whatever it may be. Yeah. But you still need to ask for help. <laughs> and and uh, so that's that's where that song came from. The um, On our first album, there's a song, Are You Weary? And mm. uh, Claire put that one together in a particular time when I had had a really bad health a bad time with my health and that one really affected me deeply the first time I heard it and it's been amazing to see how many people across the country have been helped by that song you know Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't you you put together your art and and you you hope it's helpful but you don't know how the Lord's going to use it and um, but that one really sticks out to me as one that's really held held its its own in 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 that world of what do you do when you're exhausted and you're and that one actually was written in 700 AD in Greek originally mm-hmm. the original uh, for that it was written by a guy named St Stephen of Marsavis in 700 and uh so for 1300 years you know the the church has been singing it in some form or another um and so it was cool to kind of take that to try to bring it back to the church and give us the opportunity to sing the same thing that uh, the great cloud of witnesses is singing to encourage us to press on well, I think a lot of us are weary. Yeah. And I think that it's not just back in 16 and 1700. I think it's no. in 2024 yeah. that we're weary because yeah. we can't do it on our own. I mean, th- the theme throughout this entire con- conversation has been we wanted to, we were trying to, and we can't. Yeah. And we were looking for, and we were trying and hoping for, and it didn't. And so what are the words of that song, Are You Weary, as we close to minister to those who have tuned in, just close us out with some comfort from that song. Do you remember the the final verse? The the final verse says, finding, following, keeping, struggling, 
Is Mm -hmm. he sure to bless? Saints, apostles, prophets, martyrs. Answer, yes. And the answer is yes. Lord, yes, I trust you. Lord, yes, although I can't see what you're doing, I'm going to believe that you are working all these things together for good. Whether I see it or not, on this side of heaven or the other, the answer is yes. And I think that is really truly the reframing message, which is, Lord, I'm going to say yes to you and not to my circumstances not to what I wanted, but to you as my Savior and my Lord. And that's what y'all have done and are doing through your music. Just, I just thank you for the music that you're doing and that you're writing and you're putting out there and for continuing to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you, even if it's just in cooking dinner tonight. Um, even if it's holding the flashlight up so I can change this tire that you just saved us from the tornado. (laughs) Lord, yes, Yes. thank you for what is seen and unseen, for what is known and unknown. You are sovereign and you are good. And we trust you. Thank you. Thank you for having us today. It was such an encouragement and love to talk with you. For sure. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate both of you greatly. Mm -hmm.